Right, welcome everyone to the next edition in the American Solidarity National Conference. Um, this will be the bioethics through COVID and COVID-19 panel. And I'm joined today by Dr. Joe Zalot, as well as Dr. Charlie Camosi. Um, they'll be discussing back and forth different questions that we have today, all revolving around the topic of bioethics during COVID-19. But before we get to that, we'll have a little bit, a little introduction of the two. So first, Dr. Zalot. He is a staff ethicist with the National Catholic Bioethics Center in Philadelphia. He has been with the NCBC since July 2017. And prior to the NCBC, he has served as a regional director of ethics and spiritual care for Mercy Health Cincinnati from 2015 to 2017. He was an assistant professor of religious studies and ethics at Mount St. Mary Joseph University in Cincinnati from 2004 to 2009, and an associate professor with tenure from 20, 2009 to 2015. He also served from 2016 to 2017 as a lecturer at the Athenaeum of Ohio Mount St. Mary Seminary in Cincinnati. Joe earned his PhD from Marquette University in 2002, and he has authored two books and various articles, book chapters, and has presented at academic conferences, both domestically and internationally. He is also the founder of Dr. Z Travel LLC, a faith-based travel company that offers educational and parish pilgrim, trip, pil pilgrim trips to Europe. Joe is married to his wife, Susan, and they have a daughter, Maria. And then also Dr. Camosi. He is Associate Professor of Theology at Fordham University in the Bronx, where he has taught since finishing his PhD in theology at Notre Dame in 2008. Beyond teaching, Dr. Camosi is featured in the American Journal of Bioethics, Journal of Medicine and Philosophy, Journal of the Catholic Health Association, New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, New York Daily News, and America Magazine. He also has a monthly Purple Catholicism column with Religion News Service and is the author of five books, including his most recent book, Resisting Throwaway Culture, which he published in May of 2019. Further, Dr. Kamosi advises the Faith Outreach Office of the Humane Society of the United States, which is the pro-life commission of the Archdiocese in New York. Beyond all of this, he has four children, three of whom he and his wife, Pauline, adopted from a Filipino orphanage in June of 2016. To all of you, thank you for joining today, and I'm super excited to get started. All right, so our first question, and as well, additionally to the audience, thank you for joining. If you have questions about any of the topics that we have, go ahead and drop them in the comment box below. Give us some questions, and we'll be able to talk, dialogue through as we're going, as well as answer some of those questions that we have at the end. So first, we're going to talk about human dignity. Um, during COVID-19, as you all know, COVID-19 has presented challenges in ways that we didn't think were imaginable. And so a lot of that challenged our conceptions of human dignity through our healthcare system. So we believe early, and we're going to start off early talking about um, medical resources. Early in the pandemic, we believed it was best to put persons with severe cases of COVID-19 on ventilators to help them survive. As the medical community did this, we experienced a ventilator shortage nationwide. This was one of the first times we experienced a shortage of necessary medical supplies, and we began to ration such items. Dr. Kamosi, I'm gonna to come to you first. How can we afford human dignity to all persons when we have a shortage of medical supplies? I see you led with the easiest question first. Thanks for that, Jackson. Um, good to be with you. Good to be with everyone on the call and those who watch later. Joe, it's not good to be with you, but I'll, 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 I'll deal with it. Yeah, the um, feeling's mutual, so. <laughs> um, so as a Catholic theologian, I'm in these kind of situations, I'm always trying to balance two things, a preference for the most vulnerable and just allocation of resources. And um, actually that's something you need to do all the time. And that's one of the things that's interesting to think about, like how much do we change or should we change um, our principles and values and the kind of situations that you just talked about. Um, so it's difficult in, in normal situations to think about this. It's even more difficult to think about um, balancing both in the context of a pandemic as it's unfolding. So at the very least, I think we need to say that doing it on the fly was not a good idea as so many states and hospitals and systems tried to do. You need to have a plan. You need to think about that plan. And that's one great thing um, the National Catholic Bioethics Center is there to help you with is, is for thinking in advance about these very difficult questions. Now, just because you have a plan doesn't mean it's a good plan. So some of the states um, 
Some of the states had plans, uh, but many were not very good plans. So one, in fact, even it intentionally deprioritized the quote mentally retarded. That was the language that was used in the actual plan um, for, vent for, for say ventilators if they were um, low on ventilators. Uh, so, so, so yes, plan, but, but do good planning and planning that prior, prioritizes the most vulnerable would of course not include that. I mean, one, one thing I think about too is, is the kind of language that was used, especially around the beginning of the pandemic, the language of war, the kind of like we're at war. And so this is a war, but one problem with that, and it's, it's also true in ethics in war is that it when you say you're at war, some of your most fundamental values tend to go out the window. And I think that happened during the pandemic in, in many, many different kinds of situations. Let me tell you just one example. So, um, so my home state of New York, or at least where I, where I uh, do my work at Fordham, uh, sent, as we, many of you probably know from, because it's covered uh, it, like pretty extensively by the media, um, put COVID positive patients back into nursing homes because they anticipated needing the bed spaces. So, so they were like kind of pre-rationing their bed space before things really got uh, bad. And as a result, uh, they set a wildfire of infections, deadly infections in our nursing homes in New York. And, and it's well documented how many people died and what a terrible decision it was. But it came out of this impulse to ration before they needed to. You may remember the USS Comfort was in the harbor there. They built a um, makeshift hospital in the convention center. None of these, hardly any of those beds were used. But yet we were still, and in the anticipation of it, uh, doing this really, really bad thing. And so, um, so, so that, that, that's where I think I'll leave it. Like, it's important to think about in advance. It's important to do it well, but then it's also important not to jump the gun and to just kind of, you know, flounder and react without really thinking um, before it's absolutely necessary to do. Joe, I'm going to come to you now, and then you can also respond to this. And sure. and in this process of choosing um, that Charlie just kind of outlined, people and for the past year, people chose who lived and who died. How do we? believing in human dignity and believing in the Imago Dei, how do we understand that while making these difficult decisions? Yeah, it's a, a great, uh, great question. And, uh, and again, Jackson, thanks for, for being here. And, and Charlie, thanks for being part of this uh, panel as well. We're, we, you may have, uh, Charlie gave me a little shot there, so I may give him a couple too as well. We know each other, so it's, it's, it's all good. Um, I, I, I just like to kind of start by echoing um, what Charlie said, because we were, we got caught a bit with our pants down as well when all of this hit. I think a lot of people did. We didn't realize, um, you know, the, the questions that were going to come up as quickly as they did. And, and it is very true. The last time, the, the very, the very time you don't want to be writing protocols in terms of triage uh, is when, you know, when the fires are burning right around you. I mean, it just, it's just not the, the thing to do. And we, um, you know, as Charlie mentioned, a number of states uh, had policies. We, we looked at a number of these. Uh, New York State was actually one of them, and also some, uh, some private uh, healthcare system policies. Uh, I'll, they'll remain nameless. But one of the things that we found that was really problematic is that the decision, the framework for making decisions was very utilitarian. Um, and essentially what it would come down to either in initial decisions or quote unquote tie breaking decisions uh, were, were, ish, were age, you know, those who were, those who were young get the ventilators or get the, the treatments and those who were older didn't. Now the wording to, to disguise that was interesting. It's, you know, quality years and, um, you know, maximizing life years and all that it's, you know, but when you read between the lines, you, you see it's a very utilitarian understanding or in a very utilitarian approach to, to making those types of decisions. And, and at least from where we're coming from, the Catholic perspective, um, the National Catholic Bioethics Center, that's not, um, that's not the best starting point for these types of decisions. And what we need to do is, you know, in terms of any medical decision or really any moral decision is, is recognize that, um, you know, we have a duty to, as you said, in, in the question to, to uphold the dignity of the human person. What does that mean? And I can mean some different things in different, in different ways, but at least in terms of a very practical approach to uh, the questions of triage is that we need to have, we need to, uh, to establish criteria that is, um, that is objective, that's transparent, 
um, that is going to uh, enable, hopefully, medical professionals to, to make decisions about, you know, is this particular treatment, is this ventilator beneficial for this person at this time? And if so, then there's real deep ethical questions in terms of removing it. So, um, yeah, so I, there were a lot of challenges um, to doing that. I guess one of the good things about all of this, and, and I'd like to get Charlie's uh, take on this specifically in New York City, because he was, he was there, as things kind of, um, you know, the, the triage questions waned, we would go back and talk to physicians and, and you know, around the country and, and ask them and say, you know, where were you? Did, did you ever actually experience a situation where you had to actually ration ventilators? And the response that we got was, well, no, uh, we came close in various places, but we never actually got to that point. So, um, and, and again, I don't know if that was actually the case in New York City where they were rationing ventilators. I know apparently that was happening in Italy. Um, but, um, you know, in some ways, I think this question is a bit hypothetical, uh, although it's really important for healthcare systems and states to say, okay, what are we gonna do? What, let's let's, let's uh, put some pen to paper in terms of protocols that are going to help us should something similar happen in the future. Charlie, I think you're muted. Classic mistake right off the bat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I have not heard anything like that either. And I've talked, I mean, I'm, I'm, it's nothing, it's scientific, but I've talked to a lot of people, a lot of physicians, a lot of hospital administrators. And no, like you said, came close, thought about it, thought what, thought about what they do. If they didn't, but back to the planning point, they really had no plan to try to get patients into the USS Comfort or um, the convention center if they got to that spot, right? So um, those were there, they were there to be used, but there, because it was all happy on the fly, there was no plan and, and it wasn't used properly. So even if they got close, they could have freed up bed space, and even critical care bed space by using those two resources, which they never, never came close to doing. Yeah. And just to, to for, for the audience, if, if anybody may be interested, we, we have some resources. We have about three or four different documents on our website where you know, we're um, just the names, points to consider triage in the perspective of Catholic bioethics or ethical concerns with COVID-19 tri triage protocols. Those resources are available. So if moving forward, if anybody's interested and would like our take, um, just that the information is there for people. Perfect, thank you. That, that was, I thought, informative and thoughtful, um, something to also build on. And the resources are gonna be great to read through, think upon, and then interact with. Changing a little bit through, still focusing on human dignity and talking about vaccines. Um, vaccination rates, we came out early. It looks, it looks strong. President Biden set a goal of 70% by the nation by July 4th, but that doesn't look like it's necessarily going to happen because vaccination rates are slowing. And while this might be anecdotal, just for even where I live in my part of the country, I often hear sometimes the sentiment expressed of, well, I'm not going to get the vaccine. Why should I? y'all are going to get the vaccine and that's going to protect me. And essentially it seems like people are deferring toward this sense of herd immunity that we probably will not achieve in the goal set forth by officials. Would you all be willing to interact with this thought um, from either a public health perspective, a community bioethics, even just a pro-life perspective? Is this sound reasoning to rely on other people to get vaccines? And if not, um, what is the problem with relying on other people to preserve the good of our own community? Well, as the name implies, American Solidarity Party, um, we need to be in solidarity with each other. And um, if everyone took the approach you just mentioned, there's no way we would be seeing the precipitous drop in COVID infections and deaths. And, uh, positive test um, percentages and whatnot. Um, by the way, just to think about how dramatic it is, it was the average for the pandemic was somewhere around seven or eight percent, I think, COVID positive um, tests, and now it's somewhere around two or three percent. Uh, so we are having a dramatic, dramatic, dramatic uh, lo uh, lowering of those percentages. Um, and it's only because people, again, didn't take the perspective that the people you're um, talking about took, right? Um, 
So it's actually a pretty, it's a pretty arrogant and privileged place to be able to say that, to say like, well, I'm going to be the one that stands on the sidelines, let everyone else do it. In Catholic theology, anthropology is intrinsically relational. I, there's really no way I can stand for my own good without being in a mixture of relationships, intense relationships, in fact, including baptism, uh, where my good is caught up in the good of the corporate community. No, no, not subsumed, right? That's the mystery of the Trinity. It's not subsumed, but it's caught up and intense, in, intensely connected with. That said, um, I think it's important to note that there are good reasons some people refuse the vaccine. If it's just, I wanna let other people do it or I'm too lazy or I don't know what, I, what the reasons are, that's, that doesn't rise to the level. But um, if for instance, one is fairly young, um, you have almost zero chance of having anything happen to you. Uh, and, and this is still an experimental vaccine. Uh, so I can understand why fairly young people uh, and especially you know, teenagers or even younger than that um, would be hesitant to get the vaccine because, because we don't, I mean, let's just be honest, we don't know what the long-term effects of this vaccine are. Um, and I think also for, for moral objections, um, there's a whole debate as many people on this call likely know about cooperation with evil and how the vaccines especially were tested. Um, I think there should be wide latitude for people to do that. Um, but if the presumption is, hey, I, I just don't want to do this, it's inconvenient for me, or it's, it doesn't rise to either of those two levels, that seems to be totally misguided. And we should have the presumption that we start with our duty of solidarity to the community. Yeah, I would certainly agree with Charlie said, and, and maybe even bring it to, down to an even more practical level. And, and someone in the you know, if, if there's uh, someone in the medical community who has better information about this, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of, of herd immunity is really, it, it, we have that standard really to benefit people who can't be vaccinated for some medical reason. So for example, it's usually with like say a, an MMR vaccine, a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Let's say you have a, a child who has um, an immune deficiency and physically can't take that uh, vaccine because it would cause harm to that person. Well, that person doesn't get the vaccine, but the herd immunity would at least theoretically protect that person from getting MMR. So that's really where the herd immunity uh, comes from or, or the, the importance of herd immunity comes from rather than someone saying, well, everybody else is going to get it, so I'm not going to. And I would agree with Charlie, that would be a, uh, an abandonment of, our, of the principle of solidarity. Um, that being said, um, there are and, and Charlie kind of stole my thunder a little bit on this, but that's okay. Uh, there are very good reasons why people would not take a vaccine. Um, we have a we have a 24 hour consult line and, and I can remember from about November through, oh, February, early March, we were just getting inundated with people asking, should I get, you know, should I get the vaccine? And that the objections that people had to it, nobody ever mentioned herd immunity. That, that was never stated once, at least not to me anyway. But, um, People did uh, didn't want to get the, the vaccine for reasons Charlie said the the connection to abortion drive cell lines with the you know, with the vaccines that are available now, the fact that they are still experimental, um, and, and you know the issues there. Now there's uh, the med there's the question about medical complications. Now I know there's a lot of there's good information out there and there's a lot of bad information out there. So we have to be you know you have to to really discern what is going on there, but you know those are. Those are reasons why people would refuse a vaccine. And, and we at the NCBC um, say really very similar to what Charlie said, that people need to make an informed prudential judgment of conscience based on their life situation on whether or not to receive a vaccine. And there's a lot of discussions that we could have about that. What does that mean? And we've had a lot of discussions with people about it. But you know, just to, to the, to use the, going back to the herd immunity, that's, it, it's not one that people have used, thank goodness. And, and I don't, I would agree with Charlie. It's not, um, it's, it's really not a, uh, it's not one that should be used. Let's just say that. Perfect. I do, I want to hit something y'all both said is that people are concerned about the ethical development um, because there were two, I believe Moderna and Pfizer both were developed based on, um, fetal stem cells that were developed and harvested during abortion. But there's also been the develop, development of mRNA vaccines um, that I believe Johnson, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Johnson & Johnson uses that, that style of vaccine technology. 
Going forward, does the pro-life community, should we have concerns about vaccine development? Is mRNA vaccines the way to go and we're not going to need to worry about aborted fetal tissue, tissue being used in vaccine? Can you walk us through what we should look for? What should our concerns be as pro-life community be in vaccine development in the future? I'll jump on in on this one first. Um, I, I just want to, Jack, if I, if I just uh, correct something, and I hear this quite a bit. People say um, fetal stem cells were used in the um, in the creation or the testing of these vaccines. Stem cells were not used. What we're what we're talking about are abortion drive cell line. So it's it's not stem cells, stem cells taken from human embryos. That's a whole nother issue that we could we could talk about. What we're talking about here are children who were aborted. Um, organs and tissues from those children were removed, cells were harvested from them, and those cells were coaxed to replicate themselves. So, they, so you have these abortion dry cell lines. That's what's at play here. And, and I just bring that up because when people call us up, they, they there's a lot of confusion about that. So I just wanted to clarify that. So the, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, they use those abortion drive cell lines in confirmatory testing for their uh, vaccines to make sure they would work, quote unquote. Johnson & Johnson uses them uh, even more in the development, in the ongoing manufacture and in the testing uh, as well too. So it's, it's a real concern. And one of the, maybe one of the silver linings, I hope, of this pandemic is that people wake up to the fact that pharmaceutical companies are using these abortion drive cell lines. They've been using them for 40, 50, 60 years now. Um, and in fact, the, the U.S. Catholic bishops um, from early 2000s, right up to 2018, even before the, the pandemic started, they were trying to educate people and say, hey, you know, um, can, what can we do to try to pressure pharmaceutical companies to move away from these cell lines? And apparently they can move away from these cell lines, but it, it just wasn't gaining any traction. And but now we're seeing it. So, um, you know, moving forward, um, the, the pharmaceutical companies they have and they're going to say look at you know look at the success we've had using these abortion dry cell lines we need more and more of them so the challenge for the pro-life community is to say you know hold it time out here um, let's move away from these um, from these cell lines that are that are connected uh, to abortion and let's move to different um, let's move to different sources and those sources are out there I'd add another silver lining here at the risk of being to a silver lining E. Uh, uh, one, one thing that also has come out of this in the debates is just how compromised so many of our actions are in cooperation with evil. So this is obviously remote cooperation with evil, very remote, but it's still cooperation in a particular kind of way or that, I don't wanna get into the technical debates over this, but it's problematic in a, in a in a remote way, but we we every day many of us most of us pretty close to all of us make choices that are compromised um, with uh, remote cooperation uh, with evil and and that's not an argument that we shouldn't consider this kind of cooperation. It's an argument that we should consider all of it, right? That we should say we should be more aware of how our actions do contribute and benefit from, uh, contribute to and benefit from evil and injustice. And um, one of the things I love about the, and there are many of the, about the American Solidarity Party is um, its focus on subsidiarity as a key principle of, of governance and of politics helps us, I think, better connect to the mechanisms by which products come to us and therefore help us see better um, how our connections to them might be problematic, morally problematic. Uh, too often we just, and I'm guilty of this as much as anybody, we press two buttons on our smartphone and something arrives at our front door and we have no idea how it got there, who made it, who, who, who gave it to us or, or, or how it affected the environment or what kind of slave labor was used or anything like that. But the more we can connect to the local, the more we can focus on um, those who are immediate to us um, in our economic interactions, I think the better for thinking more broadly and carefully about our cooperation with evil. That's a good point. Charlie, although you said 
think local and focus on the immediate. I am going to kind of take us broad scale right now about vaccines, specifically vaccine distribution to the global population. The U.S., we were privy to the first vaccines, and the developing world is still waiting. If you're watching the news, India is in just dire situations right now because they lack access to the vaccine. I'm going to ask several questions here. Was the U.S. receiving the vac the receiving first round of vaccines ethical above other countries who are struggling? And then should the countries who contributed to the most to most of the development of the vaccines receive the first doses, or should it be evenly distributed across the country so that we're as a nation, as a as a world, truly working towards this hurt global herd immunity? So uh, Catholic social teaching has a number of principles that would apply here. And one of them is subsidiarity, which I mentioned just, just in the last question. Uh, but another is an, another one is one I mentioned, which is priority, the priority of concern for the poor or the vulnerable. And um, in many cases, this is a balancing act of the principles. And so I don't think we were wrong, at least at first, to focus on those closest to us, whether that's our state or or you know, local community, church community, um, nation state, but there's also this duty of solidarity, which which with when it's combined with preference for the most vulnerable, which can't be limited by borders, can't be limited by your local community, and that's the great balance, but also the great struggle within Catholic social teaching is how do we think about our duties to the local and our duties to our neighbors versus our duties to our distant distant neighbors and. Um, and there's no easy answer to that, but, but I th at least in the abstract. But I think once it became clear that, as you mentioned, our vaccine rate use was going down and our stockpiles were going up, and even, as you mentioned, wasted even, um, it was absolutely unconscionable, a national embarrassment that we didn't move more quickly uh, to, to help uh, the most vulnerable, be in solidarity with the most vulnerable overseas. Uh, I think history, frankly, is gonna ju judge us quite harshly for this. Yeah, again, um, the principles of Catholic social teaching or, or what to understand them are one thing and putting them into practice is sometimes something else can be very, very difficult to do. I would just say in Jackson, in, re in response to your question, was it ethical for, to, uh, you know, to, to, I don't want to say focus necessarily on the United States. I think there's a real practical issue to this as well, too. I mean, uh, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines were uh, they were physically manufactured, or they are physically manufactured here in the United States. And um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I can't remember which one is which, but one of them has to be stored at a very, very low temperature, and then one has to be stored at a low temperature. So there's the logistics of all of that. So it just, you know, just from a very practical sense that, okay, we're, we're, we're producing these vaccines, and we need to get them to where they need to be used as quickly as possible. And that's, you know, most of the time, that's going to mean, you know, physical proximity. So here in the U.S., as the distribution channels, as the logistics channels work their way out, then, you know, then that duty to, to um, expand that distribution, you know, increases as well. I'm not aware, I, I guess I haven't been following, you know, the questions about um, how many vaccines were stockpiling and how many of them have been wasted, if that's true. Um, and I'll, I'll, for, you know, for the sake of here, I'd grant that that's true. That, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, it's highly problematic um, based on, you know, based on what we're seeing in other, in other nations as well. And, and it should, it should challenge us. Absolutely. Okay, that's great. Another question I have, right, about vaccines, maybe not even specifically the COVID one, but just in general. Um, is it wrong for Johnson Johnson, Moderna, Pfizer to profit from vaccines? I know right now, like when I got my COVID shot, I just walked up, sat down, got, got the shot, sat in 15 minutes in the chair and then moved on. But if there was a cost to this or for future medication, medi medications and even previous medications, is it wrong to profit off the health of people when millions of humans have died across the world? Should companies large pharma companies be profiting from what they have that can save or cure the disease that's challenging the world? Go ahead, Charlie. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> but, but, but let me say more about that. So, um, 
rightly ordered markets or markets that are disciplined by some of the values you've been talking about for the last half hour or so have problems. Um, but any economic system has problems. And the good that came from these companies, at least in my view, um, expecting to make a profit was saved countless lives. So Moderna and Pfizer, if, if you want, I mean, probably a lot of people know this already, but I'll just say it just in case it isn't um, there. The, the vaccines that, that they produced were in some ways already in development. So the mRNA technology was very much already in development. And that's why it was able to get off the ground so quickly and save as many lives as it has and will. Um, now, if there was no profit motive for Moderna and Pfizer to be at that space, how many more people would have died? You know, it's 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 a it's a countless number, right? It's a, uh, it's a huge number of people. Um, but but I'm not a and 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 uh, you got two Catholic thinkers here. I, I, as a Catholic thinker, I can't say that we that we don't think at all about limiting markets. Of course, we limit markets all the time, and we should. And it's worth noting that. A lot of the profits, especially that Moderna, I don't think Pfizer took government money, but Moderna got paid by the government for their um, for their uh, vaccines, right? Uh, or, or at least they were part of that Operation Warp Speed uh, program in the way that Pfizer was not. Um, so it is, isn't even as simple as the market has traditionally thought of. It's uh, it could be seen as governments, right, uh, in uh, rewarding um, Moderna for being on the being ready to deliver on and i think moderna is much smaller if somebody correct me on this wrong it is much smaller than pfizer and was yeah. basically like betting its whole future on mnr and mrna vaccines and so that was motivated by profit and just staying afloat as a company so again i think these are good things um but of course a market needs to be disciplined and 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 uh and and we we know I'll finish with this. We know that markets exist for people, not people for markets. And in this case, the market really did serve people very very well. Yeah, I'd uh, like to just preface my comments that by saying that as I've grown older and maybe marginally wiser, I hope I, I'm coming to kind of question more and more um, that here in the United States, health is essentially a commodity. I mean, it is something that we buy and sell. And I think that's, that's kind of an umbrella um, thing to keep in mind here. That being said, in principle, I don't think it's wrong for companies to profit from vaccines. I mean, as Charlie said, I mean, the, the profit motive in a, a capitalistic economy, it drives innovation. And that is a good thing. I mean, if you, you look at how we have developed as a country, I mean, go back to 1776 to today. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. The, the innovation that we've had and and a, a very great percentage of that is 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 built on um, on the profit motive um, you know you, you build a better mousetrap you're going to benefit from it and and that's a good thing uh, overall I would say however that um, that you know as Charlie mentioned the the pharmaceutical companies did receive a lot of money from uh, the U.S. taxpayer. So I, I just, we use uh, information from the Charlotte Lozier Institute. So Johnson & Johnson apparently got about $1.4 billion in U.S. money, uh, U.S. taxpayer money to develop the vaccine. Moderna was about $2.4 billion. And uh, according to that, I have to go back, look, um, the Pfizer was $1.95 billion. We could go take a look at that again. But, you know, th those are not small amounts of money and it's U.S. taxpayer money. So what I would hope and I don't know if this is going to happen or not, but what I would hope is that you know these these pharmaceutical companies were working on uh, mRNA technology beforehand. There was a capital outlay for them as well, but the U.S. taxpayer also um, pitched in and 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 contributed to the to the development and the distribution of these vaccines. So I'm I'm I, I wouldn't be opposed to if the U.S. taxpayer were to uh, receive some sort of percentage of any profits that are given. I don't know how how feasible that is, but at least in theory. Um, it, it seems that we should benefit uh, some way from it. Now, if that's that everybody gets a free vaccine, Jackson, Jackson as you said, uh, so be it. Uh, but it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of things to, to keep in mind here. But just in terms of the overall question, I don't have a problem with the profit motive in the sense that it's bringing about innovation, which is bringing about good. Okay. 
That's great. I do want to remind the audience that if you have a question about anything that we say or something even adjacent to what we're saying related to bioethics and any time with COVID-19, go ahead and drop that question in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom chat. And we'll hopefully get to that at the kind of the end of our session as we wrap up. But believing vaccines, I want to talk about um, the Dobbs case that's coming up. I don't know uh, for our audience if you're keeping up with the most breaking Supreme Court news. Uh, but the Supreme Court has granted writ of certiari in the case of Dobbs v. Jackson's Women's Health. And that's it. That centers around the topic of abortion. Um, so I kind of want to, with our two panelists today, talk through and process a little bit about what is what's happening in the field of abortion. During during the pandemic, um, abortion access in clinics was obviously restricted during the early stages of the pandemic, but um, abortion access through pills and then through mail and chemical abortions, that was expanded during the pandemic. So that's going on in some states that the mail, the mail access has been continued even since we're past kind of the, the strenuous parts of the pandemic. However, with the Supreme Court granting cert to Dobbs, um, that could potentially undo the Casey framework or overturn Casey potentially undo um, some of the road parts of the decision. Could you all talk us through where does this leave us right now in the tension that the abortion industry is in? And then I think maybe more importantly, where does it lead us to be? Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> I'll go first on this one. Actually, Jackson, if I could, I, I um, you mentioned something at the beginning of your question that I'd like to talk about a bit, of, a little bit, and that's the chemical abortion question, um, I, I, or even the, the surgical abortion question too. Um, I don't know about other parts of the country, but here in Pennsylvania, um, Planned Parenthood and other clinics didn't close. You know, during the pandemic, they stayed open and they continued terminating pregnancies all through the whole thing. Now, you are correct about um, the issue of chemical abortion, um, the, the, um, the mifepristone, misoprostol uh, two drug cocktail that, that, ends, uh, that ends pregnancies. That has been going, but that's been going up for years. I mean, the, the numbers of surgical abortions have been going down, the number of chemical uh, abortions have been going up and they have really gone up during uh, this pandemic. I mean, during the pandemic, the, the Food and Drug Administration relaxed the requirement that women actually have an in-person visit to a doctor before they get these drugs. Um, the Biden administration is, is now moving to just make that, um, you know, to make that permanent. And, um, you know, so that's, that's a real challenge uh, moving forward in terms of, that's, I, I think that's where the abortion question really is going to move in a lot of ways uh, in the future. It's going to move maybe a little less to the surgical and more to the more to the to, on the chemical side. In terms of your question about where uh, the Dobbs case, what's it going to, you know, what's it going, what's the court going to rule, and and where is it going to go? Answer is I have no idea. Um, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I've, I well, I've stopped trying to figure out what the Supreme Court's going to do in terms of their rulings because, you know, when you look at hot button topics like abortion, the decisions in recent years tend to be very very narrow. And I, and I just look at the, the recent Fulton case. It's the case here in um, Catholic Charities in Philadelphia was, the city of Philadelphia said, we're not gonna uh, contract with, the, with Catholic Charities in Philadelphia anymore because Catholic Charities refuses to place uh, children with same-sex couples. And the Supreme Court, it was a nine nothing decision with, with there's a lot of commentary on that. But this, the decision was really, really narrow. A lot of people were hoping that the Supreme Court would overrule the Smith decision and it would open things, you know, really, really um, it'd be a, a great shot in the arm for religious liberty and conscientious objection. And it really wasn't. I mean, it was a very, very narrow case. And and it's, it's, it's actually, while the ruling was very good, it's really frustrating because it just seems to be over the past years, the court is doing everything it can not to, you know, not to really adjudicate pickles that they themselves created. You know, and so my fear is that the Dobbs decision is, is probably going to be something like that. I granted, you know, I'm, I'm the eternal pessimist here, but, um, you know, as much as I would love to see the court use Dobbs to, uh, to get rid of Casey and get rid of Roe, um, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I think because the, the, the justices grant cert, grant cert for this case, they're probably going to rule something on Dobbs, but my guess is that it's going to be something very narrowly tailored. 
and they're just going to kick the can down the road and, and this is just going to keep going as as justice thomas and justice alito keep saying it's like guys we got to you know we've got to decide this stuff and i i just i, I i'm just I, i'm not holding my breath let's put it that way i i think you're fair joe to say to to not try to predict the supreme court that you'll you'll lose every time you try to do that charlie i kind of want to come to you um let, let's create a hypothetical right here that when Dobbs is handed down in a year or year and a half, whatever it comes down, the decision says Roe and Casey are overturned XOXO Justice Thomas. Um, so that happens. <laughs> abortion kicked back to the state. The American Solidarity Party leads the charge. There's a constitutional amendment added that protects life from the moment of conception. What, what next for the pro-life community? Do we go home and have, have, ice, have a scoop of ice cream and celebrate together? Is did the moral majority get what they wanted, and this is the fruits of their labor? What what do we do as pro-lifers when that's the big issue that's been around since Roe was decided in '73? How does the pro-life fight change in this hypothetical scenario? Well, first, let me thank the American Solidarity Party for being a leader on um, what I'm increasingly calling prenatal justice. It, the, what you just described. Um, would be an unimaginably wonderful victory for prenatal justice. And no one should um, say anything different. That would be extraordinary. These are these these babies bear the face of Christ in a special way as the most vulnerable among us. And right now they have virtually no protections. Um, they of course deserve equal protection of the law. And if we could, if we could um, bring that about, that would be extraordinary. However, as your question implies, um, there's way more uh, to think about beyond that, way more. Um, uh, it's not as dramatic a number, likely, as our opponents um, often say, but there will be a very large number of illegal abortions done in that kind of scenario. And women, especially desperate, poor women, um, especially women who are desperate and poor and reliant on a man in their lives, a husband or boyfriend or hookup or somebody. Um, also largely uh, often victims of um, domestic partner violence. Um, these people will still seek abortions and um, there will be available abortions to them. And so even apart from uh, this is the scenario you paint, um, but definitely in the scenario you paint, we should be thinking about supporting women and families um, uh, who are at risk for abortion in these scenarios. I teach in the Bronx. The Bronx has an abortion rate, depending what year you look at, somewhere around 45%. Um, it's one of the poorest areas of the country. It's one of the most um, racially diverse areas of the country. It is, it is a place that, that, will, that will be filled with people still seeking abortions, even if the, this scenario that you described takes hold. And so we, can't, we simply can't separate our fight for prenatal justice from our fight for pregnant women and mothers. And that's another thing I'm so proud of the American Solidarity Party for doing, which is you don't force us to choose uh, between those two. And, and since you skipped my chance to talk about Dobbs, I'm gonna take the speaker's privilege here and say something <laughs> about Dobbs. Um, I, am, I agree with Joe that, I, or at least I share the worry that, um, that it's gonna be a narrow ruling, um, especially given what we've seen recently on other issues. Um, however, they, they really have kicked this can down the road for so long. I mean, I don't know how many times they had an opportunity to take this case up. It was like 14 or 15 times or something ridiculous like that. It seems like, maybe this is me just hoping, I hope it's not, um, that, they, that they decided to finally pick it up because they had somewhere to go with it. And this country cannot continue on with just the, the lower courts having no guidance, essentially from the Supreme Court on these different cases. So maybe that's what they're thinking. Um, if I'm, I, I guess I'm going to go against Jackson's admonition against making a prediction and make one, but uh, uh, call me a contrarian, I guess. But but I think the 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 Casey framework is not going anywhere. I think Justice Roberts um, probably has an ally on the so-called right on the court for that. And they're going to try to carve out something where 
they talk about this undue burden standard differently, where the undue burden standard that Casey said actually doesn't rule out as many restrictions as they as it, as other courts have said in the past. So one thing and that get the reason I wanted to bring that up in the context of what I was just talking about is when you have more support for women and there's been a lot more support for women, not enough, but a lot more support for women since 1992 when Casey came down. Um, what constitutes an undue burden on a woman changes, right? So if you have the, for instance, universal health care, at least available um, from Obamacare, you can then make the case that this, the, the care that this gives women lessens the burden that any abortion law would have on them. Or in if, if, for instance, if you were to pass paid family leave or something like that, or have, or, 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 or a, a numerous, numerous other things. I think the court is gonna be forced if it, uh, and who knows, you know, how logical it will be in its, in its, its, its arguments and opinions. The burden is less on women than it was now in 1992. And if we take steps that I think are here, and let me finish by saying this, just this week, Jeff Fortenberry, who is a um, Republican congressman from Nebraska, proposed something called the Care for Her Act, um, which uh, an, actually an op-ed in the Washington Post um, highlighted and one of the things it does, it, it makes the child tax credit available to the prenatal child, thus giving um, uh, pregnant women, what is it, $3,700 or something like that, that they otherwise wouldn't ha have received. That, um, and it does some other things too, but that's the most dramatic one. If we can continue to do things like that as a pro-life movement, and this is what, what, one, again, the reason I love the American Solidarity Party, I hope, and again, I. Hope this isn't just you know silver lining stuff again, but I hope the court will see that these kind of resources do lessen the burden on women that certain abortion restrictions uh, could be argued. I don't agree with that, but could be argued to have, and thus might be more willing to say that a 15-week threshold is not an undue burden on women. Especially, I lied. This is what I'll finish with. Especially when the US American people support restrictions after week 12. This is another thing that just came out twice in the last couple of weeks. Both Gallup and AP found that super majorities of Americans support restrictions on abortions past week 12. So the 15 week threshold that's under review now is actually pretty tame compared to what um, what the Supreme Court is considering uh, or, or compared to what uh, Americans believe about this. All right, that's it. <laughs> yeah. If I could just just follow up with, with Charlie and, and kind of going back to your question, you know, kind of what happens next. I mean, first thing, I mean, if if the, in the Dobbs case, uh, Casey and or Roe were to be overthrown, Jackson, I would I would invite you and Charlie. We'll all get together and we'll have that big scoop of ice cream and we'll <laughs> but we'll, we'll have it with a, with an alcoholic beverage as well too. Um, if the if the American Solidarity Party can. Uh, can get a, 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 a constitutional amendment passed, I'll, I'll do the same thing for the entire party. That, I don't know who'd pay for it, but somebody would, but that, that would be fantastic. But even if that were to happen, you know, the, as Charlie said, the, the, the pro-life cause continues. And I, I would just like to highlight something, um, it's, it's on the other end of life. And, and I'll always, I always say to people that, you know, pro-life is not just abortion. Um, pro-life is, you know, through the whole of life, and really another big challenge that faces us today is the whole youth, uh, euthanasia and assisted suicide movement. And Charlie actually talked about that. I've given him a plug here, so I'm, I am going to be nice to you, Charlie, today, but um, I'll give him a plug because he, um, he testified against this in Connecticut. Uh, against an assisted suicide law. Actually talked about it quite a bit on a podcast, one of our bioethics on air podcasts with the NCBC. Um, and, and talked about it in, in great detail. And that's another, you know, it's another huge pro-life issue that's facing us. And also um, that can also be extended to, uh, to end of life care, particularly for our elderly, particularly for people who experience dementia. Um, these are huge challenges facing so so even if the abortion question were to go away which I, I don't think it's I don't think it's going to in my lifetime but there are there are many other issues um, on which life is being threatened challenged and um, we have a duty to to stand up and and, um, and speak for the good so I think if it was not already possible, exponentially more people just became interested in the ruling on Dobbs, if only for the scoop of ice cream that might be coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well the, the, the scoop for the entire American Solidarity Party is with the constitutional amendment. I just want to make that very, very, very clear. So 
Okay. And I well, he didn't, he didn't promise what day. kind of ice cream either. Let's just make that clear. Either, so. I, I'm actually, Charlie, I'm going to ask you to pitch in to pay for it because I don't, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pay for the whole thing myself, but I, I think you'd probably be, uh, I, th get I think some, we get some fundraisers. Yeah, we'll get, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get a donor. There you go. There we go. I'm going to go to some questions from the audience uh, really quickly uh, as we have about 10 minutes left. The first one's coming from Andrew. He says, if it becomes, and this is going to go back to a previous topic, if it becomes necessary to ration a medical resource in the pandemic, what is the best way to do so according to Catholic ethics? Go ahead. Uh, it's so it's so tough to talk about these things in the abstract, right? Um, but I guess I would just repeat something I said earlier, which is um, you have to balance two things. You have to balance a preference for the most vulnerable in ways, of course, which don't violate civil rights. That would be a good way to start, right? Don't <laughs> violate civil rights. Like don't discriminate on the basis of age or ability or something like that. But then do wrestle with the fact that in a resource limited situation, you have to say that no one person um, or group is entitled to a disproportionate amount of the community's resources. There needs to be justice and distribution of resources. What that looks like, what that means, how those two things get balanced in a particular situation, I, I am unable to say um, unless we're actually in the situation. I will also repeat something else I said, which is we should be loathe to do it until we absolutely have to do it. So we should not be excited. I mean, one, one thing that I found, I don't know if you found this, Joe, is so many bioethicists and others who like to pontificate about these things seemed almost excited about the possibility of rationing. Like, oh, we're going to have to ration, right? Like, and like, we're excited to talk about, well, here's what's going to happen and here's how it's going to go. And I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not, but, but we jumped the gun in New York and uh, I think probably in Minnesota and a few other places, and we didn't need to. Um, so this is ab like war. It's an absolutely last resort um, type thing. That should be something that we should drive home to from a Catholic perspective. Yeah, Jackson was the, was the the person who submitted the question. Was his name Andrew? Is that what you said? Yes, it is. So, so Andrew, if um, we have, and I'm not going to try to talk about it here, but we have on our website. I think I mentioned before, we have a number of resources that we've written and we talk about. You know, what are the ethical principles? How do, how do you how do you do this? from a Catholic perspective on our website. And if you uh, wanted to contact me through the National Catholic Bioethics Center, I'd be happy to just send those resources to you or, or, or um, tell you where they are on our website. I, I will say just, just very, very quickly and in a, in a uh, very practical way that any decisions, any standards that you're gonna create for, for limiting or directing treatment should be based number one on objective measures, right? So they are, they apply equally as much as they can to all. Clinical criteria have to be taken into consideration um, as, a, as a primary means of, of decision making. So for in terms of COVID, uh, I know people have talked about Apache scores or SOFA scores, that type of stuff. What's, what's the objective clinical criteria that's driving um, the question of whether this person should receive a ventilator or not? And also we would say that, that decisions should be focused on short-term survival. In other words, is this ventilator going to help this person cross this bridge, you know, from point A to point B and, and, and get over COVID and not look at, you know, what are the, you know, quality life years and all of those other words that basically say, you know, we're going to give, we're going to give um, medical interventions to younger people and quote unquote he healthier people rather than older people. So it, it's a really, really quick um, summary, but we, we do have a lot more information. I'd be happy to send it to you. That's really good. I, I question, so I think throughout, I mean, really since February, March, 2020 up through now, even some of the questions uh, that the audience has asked is what about this or what if this happens? And so really in the public square, bioethics has dominated our conversation for a year, year going on a year and a half, really. But bioethics sometimes I think feels too esoteric for people who aren't formally trained in bioethics. And there's all this language and then you're not sure what this means you kind of need a medical background a lot of people have a theological background and sometimes it feels like a very unattainable conversation but i think quite the contrary is is true so how as kind of the final question parting question what are some resource resources you all would provide to our audience that they can help educate themselves and inform themselves so that they have the framework to be thinking about these issues going forward 
I'll start with this one and then I'll give Charlie the last word because I know he likes to have the last word. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question at the end just so you have to have the last word. Oh, the thunderstorm's coming. I can feel my internet is about to go down. So I don't know if I'll be able to do oh, that. Okay. No, but um, Jackson, I, I, just two things um, on that. And and I, I guess maybe this is a, this is a shameless plug, but I'm, I'm going to do it. So we at the NCBC, we have a 24-hour consult service. So if people have uh, bioethics questions, they can email us, they can call us. And one of the things that I've, I've learned from doing it now for almost four years is I always tell people, trust your moral intuitions. And what do I mean by that? So we will get calls. Most of our calls, or the biggest percentage of our calls are end of life situations. You have a, a loved one who is, um, there's a patient who's, who's very ill and they have a healthcare power of attorney. Usually it's a child, an adult child, who has to make a decision. And it's literally a life or death decision, you know, in terms of pursuing a medication, not pursuing an intervention, whatever. And they call us up and they're explaining the situation, explaining what, they, what they're thinking about doing. I'm gonna guess, and I'm probably being conservative on this, 90% of the time, the, peop, the person, they already know the answer. They, they, you know, their moral intuition is correct. And I always encourage people to do that. So for people who are listening now or may, you know, listen in the future, when you have a bioethics challenge, or really, well, I don't want to say any moral challenge, but specifically a bioethics challenge, more often than not, I would encourage people to listen to their moral intuitions because, again, my experience, more often than not, um, their moral intuitions are correct. That being said, um, I would I would encourage people to educate themselves, educate themselves, educate themselves as best they can um, with good information. There's a lot of information out there, a lot of bad information out there, but with good information and get support. And um, again, I think the NCBC is a great resource for that. Uh, on our website, we've got a section it's called Topics in Bioethics, and we have a whole bunch of different topics with NCBC resources and other things there. We have our Bioethics on Air podcast where we talk about um, these issues. And as I said, we also have our, our consultation service, which people can access through our website and, um, and, and call us up. And, and we're there 24 hours a day to help people through these questions. Um, the resources are there and, and we're willing to help. Yeah, though it pains me to say so, I want to agree with Joe here and say um, <laughs> this is being recorded, right, Jackson? I got you. Got, you. <laughs> uh, there's some really great stuff going on at the National Catholic Bioethics Center. Um, the only, re the only, of course, episode I'd recommend from the Bioethics on Air episode is the one he did with me. So uh, well, there was two parts. So it'd be there two were two episodes. parts, right? So yeah, both so. of them, both of them. Those are the only ones I'd recommend. No, actually, uh, there's really, really good episodes, especially one with Roger Severino, which gets into uh, a lot of the issues we've, or some of the issues we've talked about today in more depth. And from a perspective, who, literally on the ground, he was running the office that was investigating whether civil rights were violated um, in some of these protocols. Um, uh, I just published an article with a, um, with a, uh, with a ethics and medics um, uh platform at NCBC, which is for popular, more popular consumption, not academic consumption. So that's maybe something that people um, would want to look at. If you want different points of view, there's a blog um, called Practical Ethics from the University of Oxford, which has very different points of view from the ones that Joe and I outlined. If you want to think about people with um, maybe different intuitions about some of these things uh, and think about how uh, you might respond. Um, Joe and I have different audiences. My students come in with very, very different points of view than the people who tend to call, I think, the National Catholic Bioethics Center for their for their views. And so I have to, in, in my classes, I have to work just to even have a, you know, a, plur, a plurality of views expressed, much less, you know, come to the, come to the one that, that I think is right. Um, let me, let me say this too about the, um, maybe as a, I don't know if Joe agrees with me about this, but I think it's a dirty little secret. There are a lot of people doing bioethics out there who, with very little training and, and background. So um, the head of a hospital ethics committee, for instance, could easily have never taken a bioethics course in his or her life. Maybe they have some kind of certificate 
or, or at most maybe a master's degree or something like that. So, and that's the head of the ethics committee. That, there are plenty of people on the ethics committee who, who have virtually no background, um, academic background at all. And uh, so I just second what, what Joe said about trusting your um, intuitions on this and educating yourself and, and, and diving into those conversations. And, and it, there's room for you in these conversations. There's room for you to learn, uh, but there's also room for you to participate. If, uh, some of you may be in a context where you could join a clinical ethics committee. Um, I'd encourage you to do something like that. Uh, we need good uh, hearted people who understand what the American Solidarity Party is about on those ethics committees, it seems to me. And so, yes, don't be intimidated by principalism or the principle of double effect or any of these things that, that may seem daunting if you don't know what they are. Um, you can learn about them and, and there are resources to learn about them, but often the people for worse, not better, for worse, um, who are on the ethics committees themselves don't know anything about them either, frankly. Well, we are unfortunately out of time. It is five o'clock on the East Coast. Um, so again, thank you all, Dr. Joe Zalot, and as well as Dr. Charlie Smosey for coming on here, talking. I'm, I found this enriching um, to, to think about and to hear your perspectives, and I'm sure the audience did as well. For those watching for the rest of the convention, we'll take a two-hour break, and then at 7 o'clock, there will be a reconvene for a panel with Dr. George Yancey, as well as a large speaker panel, and then finally, the keynote address. So you come join us at 7 um, and until then, eat dinner, take a break, and then be sure to check out uh, Solidarity's merchandise shop. I'll be able to drop that link in the chat so you can get so you can go find your favorite new mask or mug or sweatshirt, whatever you want. Again, to the two panelists today, thank you for coming, thank you for sharing, thanks for speaking, and we'll see the, everyone else in about two hours. <laughs>